Good evening. Uh, I'm John Pandolfino. I'm the president of the ANMS, and I'd like to welcome you to the ANMS virtual symposium series. Uh, tonight we have some great talks on constipation, and first I'd like to introduce the moderator, Dr. Justin Wheeler, who's an assistant professor and director of pediatric motility at the University of Utah. Justin? Thanks, Dr. Pandolfino, for the introduction. I'm, I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Jose Garza, Dr. Nitin Ahuja, and Dr. Alessandra Geisher. As a reminder, if you'd like to submit questions during the presentation, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom uh, meeting app. The, the chat box can be used for discussion, but all questions for panelists to just go through the Q&A box. For those of you who might be watching this at a later time, you can just submit questions on the Doc Matters platform, and they'll be addressed in coming days in the Doc Matters Forum. So our first speaker is Dr. Jose Garza. Dr. Garza practices pediatric GI, GI care for kids in Atlanta, Georgia. He's the gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition system medical director for Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and medical director of neurogastroenterology and motility for Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Dr. Garza. Thank you very much for the presentation and I wanna thank everybody uh, for being here today. Um, I'm excited about uh, talking about pediatric constipation. Uh, I want to talk to you all and realize that pediatric constipation is different from adult constipation. And this is why it's important that we have this forum where we can both learn from each other. So pediatric constipation is extremely common. A worldwide pool prevalence of functional constipation in children is about 9.5%. There is no difference in sex prevalence. But in adults, it is more common in women with an odds ratio of 2.2. Although healthcare utilization of uh, constipation is an important subject throughout the age groups. You can see in the pediatric population, we have a high utilization that increased in the one to 17 from 2006 to 2011, followed closely by those adults over 85. And really is that 25% of children treated for functional constipation continue to have symptoms into adulthood. So this is important because adult gastroenterologists are gonna inherit a lot of our patients. And of these, poor prognosis is fecal incontinence and young age of onset. And we're not doing as great of a job of we think we are or that we want to do because 50% of children referred to a pediatric gastroenterologist are still symptomatic after five years and 20% still struggle with some symptoms after 10. We have the Rome 4 functional constipation criteria and it's divided by age in infants and toddlers up to age four, children and adolescents and adults. And they vary uh, within the age group. So for infants and toddlers, we're gonna have more than two of the following criteria for over a month. So less than two defecations per week, painful or hard bowel movements, excessive stool retention, large diameter stool, or a fecal mass in the rectum. And Rome 4 added for those toddlers under the age of four that are toilet trained to add the episode of fecal incontinence as well as hard stools that obstruct the toilet. And by adding this, they were more likely to meet the criteria than those that were not toilet trained, 42% versus 9%. And it's interesting to see that the prevalence of functional constipation increases with age. For children and adolescents, the criteria is similar, but just modified for those that are able to have a bowel movement in the toilet. So less than two defecations in the toilet, which is similar across all ages. History of painful or hard stools, retentive posturing, large stools, fecal mass in the rectum, one or more episodes of fecal incontinence, as well as an insufficient criteria for IBS. Adults, the first two, are similar across everyone, less than two defecations and lumpy of hard stools. But after that, there's more about straining, sensation of incomplete evacuation, sensation of anorectal obstruction, manual maneuvers to facilitate defecation, and also the insufficient criteria for irritable bowel syndrome, 
and that loose stools are rarely present without laxatives. So as a pediatric gastroenterologist, when I see this, the first thing that calls an attention is that we do not see manual maneuvers in the pediatric population. It is extremely rare that a child will do this to facilitate defecation. And also, another thing is, where is fecal incontinence? And the reason why we say this is because 75 to 90% of children with chronic constipation that see a pediatric gastroenterologist have fecal incontinence. And when you compare adult fecal incontinence, which is most likely due to a different etiology, pediatric fecal incontinence is going to be most likely due to fecal impaction that causes overflow incontinence. And also, because this is so common, another common manifestation because of that large um, stool in the rectum is going to be that bladder gets irritated, gets hyperactive, creating uh, urinary incontinence. So in pediatrics, we have very frequent fecal incontinence and urinary incontinence. And both or all of the functional constipation, even though they have their multifactorial across all ages, there are some age significant differences. HAPCs decrease as the colon matures in frequency and increases the segmental contractions. This happens through infancy all the way through the teen years. Also in pediatrics, there are certain developmental areas where it can be triggered to a constipation. So during infancy, feeding changes from breast milk to formula, introduction to solid foods, toilet training, beginning of school, people don't wanna have a bowel movement. If it's out of the house, they start withholding. And in general, in children, out of all the children that have constipation, about 95% are functional constipation. And out of all those functional constipation, the most common cause is withholding behavior. So withholding behavior is the uh, model of dysenergic defecation in adults with the difference that our patients do not want to have a bowel movement and will hold the bowel movement. So in adults, dysenergic defecation is roughly 25 to 35% of the patients. So in pediatrics, there are going to be painful stools that lead to withholding, retention of stools, fecal impaction that decreases the urge, has rectal hypercompliance, mega rectum, rectal hyposensitivity, which increases the impaction. So finally, after seven days or more, there's this large, huge bowel movement that obstructs the toilet, which reinforces how painful this is and makes the child continue to withhold and continue the vicious cycle. So another difference when we evaluate children in the office with a physical exam, a digital examination not always necessary and sometimes will be a worsening the behavior. Differently from adults with a di digital rectal exam, you need to exclude a mechanical obstruction like tumor or mass, and you're more likely to be able to assess anal sphincter and pelvic floor functions, which you cannot do in a child that's not cooperative. But we do at least need to look, and we are also concern about uh, malformations. This is a child that was referred for hemorrhoids, and you can see the anal fistula anterior to the muscle complex, which was thought to be the hemorrhoids. And also in uh, females, some people um, argue that the distance between the anal orifice and the labia, but it adds an unreliable approach to identify uh, perianal fistula. We need to look at the anal canal and the skin changes surrounding the anal canal to make sure they meet as opposed to here where they're clearly anterior. So constipation, it's a one symptom in a big bucket. And there can be numerous etiologies to put that reason why the patient is constipated. But in pediatrics, because most of the patients have functional constipation, we're not gonna do testing unless there are alarm symptoms or we have failed medical management. Adults, uh, their constipation is more likely to be secondary to a systemic disease or medication than it is in children. That's why in children, doing blood tests for celiac disease, thyroid, or lead poisoning in children that have otherwise no other symptoms or red flags 
really increases healthcare costs without actually changing any outcomes. Also, in children, differentiating the subtypes of constipation is of less importance in clinical practice. Most of our patients are going to have outlet obstruction. We do utilize them, and we also use them to differentiate between retentive and non-retentive fecal incontinence. Because fecal incontinence is so common, um, we often miss and, and can be very difficult to elicit when it's non-retentive fecal soil, as well as when the clinical picture does not make sense. Anorectal manometries and colonic manometries, we might probably do a lot more colonic manometries than the adult uh, counterparts. Um, our anorectal manometry is mostly geared to finding the rectal anal inhibitory reflex to rule out Hirschsprung's disease. We inflate the balloon in the rectum, seeing the baseline pressure drop, and then recover and go back to normal. So in children, the most common reason for a true absent uh, rare is going to be Hirschsprung's disease versus in adults where there's going to be likely to a megarectal. We like to assess the dose response of the sphincter as when we do the rectal anal inhibitory reflex, as well as the, how it looks um, in patients that have a very overactive response with some anal spasms. This can be sign of um, spinal cord lesion and even of spina bifida occulta. For colonic manometry, we have the patient after we place the catheter, um, we evaluate over fasting when they wake up. Then we feed them to look at the increase in motility index. That's the gastrocolonic reflex. And we add bisicodal to stimulate HAPCs. And after the, we give bisicodal, we actually elicit this HAPCs. And in this recent paper, it said that HAPCs are elicited with bisicodal in up to 93% of children with refractory constipation, with the majority of this terminating in a synchronous pressurization in the rectus sigmoid. If they uh, are, have absence of propagation, it's an abnormality, and it can be either a long segment or almost all of the colon, and in extremely rare cases, colonic inertia, where the colon does not move at all. Now, it is important that, to know that the utility of the colonic manometry is to guide therapy in the need of surgery, not to change medical management. We should not do a colonic manometry until we failed all medical management and surgery is being contemplated. When we're talking about treatment in functional constipation, sometimes I'm jealous of the larger toolbox that adult gastroenterologists have at their hand in compared to our more limited choices of medication. And even with this, sometimes um, social media and the media itself um, are having uh, concerns about Miralax and side effect in kids. But there is no data or scientific evidence that polyethylene glycol is damaging at all in children. It actually, so far, the evidence is that it is safe and effective therapy as a first-line regimen for kids. It is important that when we're treating our patients in pediatrics, we're going to have a complete bowel evacuation as a first step. And then once we clean that impaction, give enough daily therapy to avoid it from coming back. In my opinion, stimulant laxatives are widely available and greatly underutilized. In patients that can have withholding behavior and dyssynergia, if we think and we clean all this out with polyethylene glycol, even if we give a stool softener, by the time the patient is going to have the urge to defecate again, and there's going to be enough um, amount of volume to stretch this, we're going to be again impacted. So this stimulant laxative to help defecate even kids that do not want to, they can definitely help adults who want to but can't. Minor side effects with Senna, long-term use is safe. There is no evidence of tolerance to Senna. And recently this month, long-term use of bisacoral in pediatrics, 55% were successfully weaned off bisacoral and having very mild side effects that most respond with dose adjustment. 
What happens with uh, secretagogues? Well, lubiprostone, an open label study, efficacious and well tolerated. The problem, open label. Why? Because when the pediatric study for pucalopride was done, the open label had a fibril efficacy. But once you do this with a multi center, double blind, placebo controlled trial, then it was no more effective than placebo. But most of it is because the mean age was 4.5, and also 70% of children have outlet dysfunction defecation. And when you look at an adult study comparing polyethylene glycol with procalopride in patients that have dominant symptoms consistent with evacuation disorder, which is the type of constipation most of our patients have, in those adults, procalopride was actually not as effective as polyethylene glycol. And another thing is, if nothing else is working, another help that we can do is have rectal therapy. And in a lot of these patients with mega rectums and chronic constipation and fecal soiling that has been refractory, doing irrigations with either a Foley catheter and a gravity bag, or even with a more fancy system, actually prevent surgical intervention and have very high success rates estimated to be 78% and 84% when reported as overall improvement. Surgery should be just last resort and in patients that have already been assessed with good compliance and they're gonna need this on the long run. This is a paper in patients with anorectal manometries and what they use for continence. As you can see, as they get older, more and more in red and light blue, patients use anti-grade continence enema and also anti-grade continence enemas in patients with functional constipation actually notice that the colon motility improves being able to be weaned off. And when their recent paper compared anti-grade continence enema with sacral nerve stimulator, which is an exciting new therapy, turns out that anti-grade continence enema improves bowel movement frequency, abdominal pain, and is able to discontinuate laxatives, where there's sacral uh, nerve stimulator actually improved fecal incontinence. This is an exciting new therapy, and I'm gonna thank you and put a special shameless plug for our next month's neuromodulation on, um, they're gonna talk about vagal nerve stimulator, gastric electrical stimulation, and neuromodulation for anorectal disorders with excellent speakers. And with that, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Garza, for that great presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Nitin Ahuja. Dr. Ahuja is an assistant professor of clinical medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology, um, Hepatology at, at the University of Pennsylvania. There he also serves as co-director of the program in neurogastroenterology and motility and is associate program director of the Gastroenterology Fellowship. Dr. Ahuja. Thanks very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me just pull up my slides. All right. Um, so I'm uh, glad to be talking to you all this evening about updates in constipation. Um, I'm going to make the assumption that most folks in the audience have their own approach to constipation. I certainly have mine. But I wanted to start um, as the adult gastroenterologist with um, the recommendation from the AGA for the typical approach to constipation in an adult practice, just to review it briefly. Of course, we start with an interview and exam. And based on that, consider uh, any necessary baseline metabolic and structural evaluation. And then moving on pretty early to an empiric therapeutic trial, either with dietary fiber or over-the-counter laxatives. In the event of an inadequate response, we query pretty early for pelvic floor dysfunction, typically with an anorectal manometry and balloon expulsion test. If that's abnormal, diagnose a defecatory disorder for which pelvic floor physical therapy is usually the first line intervention. If it's inconclusive, consider a defecography to further evaluate for an outlet disorder. Um, and if it's normal, then consider colonic transit testing potentially to differentiate between slow and normal transit constipation, recognizing that that differentiation doesn't always bear significantly on 
uh, clinical management. So my purpose tonight is not necessarily to overhaul this algorithm in any significant way, but rather to um, focus on new insights over the past couple of years at a few different levels in this algorithm um, to maybe add some dimension to uh, the overall approach. So specifically, I'm going to start by talking about a recent expert consensus uh, about android luminometry, then move on to novel data regarding pharmacotherapy, uh, advanced pharmacotherapy that can be considered uh, typically after diagnostic evaluation is complete, and then round back to the beginning in the last few minutes to talk about some shades of gray that have emerged with regard to fiber and non-pharmacologic constipation management. So I want to start talking about uh, the London classification of anorectal disorders. This was a publication that was put out uh, at the end of last year by the International Anorectal Physiology Working Group. This was a, a consensus group of 29 physicians and surgeons that aimed to address the increasing heterogeneity in both technology and practice patterns associated with uh, anorectal manometry. Um, and so uh, just to review, interactive manometry is a, a catheter-based approach that's quantitative, uh, used to assess disorders of anorectal function, increasingly widespread in physiology laboratories uh, on the adult side. Uh, but uh, folks in the audience who read these regularly will be sensitive to their limitations. I think the major ones are the fact that normative parameters uh, remain in a relative sense poorly delineated they tend to vary by catheter and software system, and variations in methodology can influence results. So the first thing I want to point out uh, as uh, a step forward from the London classification is the um, establishment of a consensus protocol regarding the minimal standard elements that ought to be included in a monometry protocol, as well as their preferred order. And that's listed on the right side uh, of this slide. Um, it's also the case that the London classification has put together a uh, revised and common language for discussing uh, disorders of anorectal function. Um, so prior to the London classification, um, uh, we talked about defecatory dyssynergia typically in four different subtypes based on the presence or absence of rectal pressure generation, and then anal sphincter pressure being either paradoxically contracting, weakly relaxing, or adequately relaxing. Um, so the revised uh, diagnostic scheme uh, incorporates, I think, usefully the results of balloon expulsion testing into uh, the results of the manometric evaluation and, in fact, begins with balloon expulsion results, uh, characterizing it as abnormal, yes or no. If it is abnormal, then focusing on uh, rectal pressure generation being above the lower limit of normal, and then focusing on either uh, the anal pressure decreasing uh, appropriately or not. Um, so uh, important distinctions here are the fact that the distinction between the paradoxical contraction and weak relaxation has fallen away. Um, and that even if the anal pressure uh, relaxes appropriately, the lack of good propulsive force from the rectum is on its own indicative of, uh, of defecatory dysfunction. And then I think, um, something that we've been doing anecdotally commonly, uh, which is regarding as inconclusive a discordance between balloon expulsion and manometry results is here formalized as inconclusive, which is also helpful. A similar consensus language is put forward with regard to baseline tone and squeeze that I'll skip over just for the sake of time. And likewise for rectal sensory testing. So of the three usual sensory parameters that we look at, namely first sensation, urgency and maximum tolerated distension volume. If a patient has at least two out of three being greater than the upper limit of normal, that's diagnostic of rectal hyposensitivity. If there's one that's greater than the upper limit of normal, that's borderline rectal hyposensitivity, which is again an inconclusive finding. And if there's at least one that's less than the lower limit of normal, that's consistent with rectal hypersensitivity. So I think the elephant in the room here is that it's, it's helpful to, to define things in terms of upper and lower limits of normal, but it's even more helpful to actually define those limits. Um, that limitation was acknowledged by the authors of this um, manuscript uh, by saying that the variation that exists in the published literature with regard to these normal values made it beyond the remit of this project to recommend specific normal values, but they also 
um, gesture towards the fact that this is just the first iteration of recommendations. And so the hope would be that this functions as a kind of scaffold uh, for the development of more specific nuanced data moving forward. I think the implied analogy, at least in my mind, is to the Chicago classification, which is currently in its third iteration and really provides a strong, confident foundation for uh, the diagnostics of esophageal dysmotility. The hope would be in the years ahead that we might move to something similar for anorectal function. So moving on to pharmacotherapy, um, there is uh, an increasing range of options uh, on the adult side in that larger toolbox that Dr. Garza mentioned. Um, the, um, probably the, the biggest impact on my practice has been the arrival of procalipride, which was FDA approved in December of 2018 for chronic idiopathic constipation. Um, I imagine most people in the audience are familiar, but just to review, uh, it's a 5-HT4 receptor agonist, so it functions as a prokinetic. And to the extent that those receptors are present throughout the GI tract, it's got potential for off-label use in cases of proximal dysmotility, uh, such as gastroparesis or uh, intestinal pseudo-obstruction. Of course, the FDA has not approved it for those uses, though in patients in whom multi-segment dysmotility is suspected, where the colon is involved, it may be a preferred first-line option. This is an image from a 2015 randomized control trial that was done um, in men with chronic idiopathic constipation. You can see a significant um, difference between uh, the two arms uh, relative to the primary endpoint of uh, at least three spontaneous complete bowel movements per week. There's mechanistic resonance, of course, with cisapride, uh, which is an old drug that was used for gastroparesis uh, taken off the market due to sudden cardiac death mediated by QTC prolongation. Um, in light of that history, there's been extensive study of procalipride for any evidence of cardiotoxicity, and thus far, there's been no significant evidence of QTC prolongation, likely due to greater selectivity for gut serotonin receptors. Um, there are side effects that I advise patients about, typically diarrhea, headache, and nausea. I quote those at a rate of 10 to 20 percent. There is dose adjustment needed in patients with kidney disease because it's really uh, excreted, and this is pregnancy category C, so ideally stopped uh, in the context of pregnancy. Moving on to tenapanor, uh, this is um, one of the investigational agents that's probably furthest along in the development pipeline in the States. It's uh, an inhibitor of an intestinal transporter called NHE3, sodium hydrogen exchanger isoform 3. Um, it works by increasing intraluminal sodium, which fluid then follows. So functionally, I think of it as a, as a secretagogue. Um, it's minimally absorbed in first in its class. In parallel, it's been, absor it's been um, pursued as a treatment for hyperphosphatemia and renal disease because that intracellular hydrogen transport happens to also increase uh, or sorry, diminish paracellular uptake of, of phosphate from the lumen. Uh, so useful in that context as well. But focusing specifically on IBSC, this phase three study that was published just earlier this year demonstrated significant benefits over placebo in a combined endpoint, uh, looking at abdominal pain and complete spontaneous bowel movements. Interestingly to me, uh, looking at complete spontaneous bowel movements alone, there was no significant difference um, noted between the two arms, but the combined endpoint is the FDA preferred one. And so based on these data and others, it was actually FDA approved for the use of IBSC in 2019 and pre-marketing activities are underway uh, in the state. It's currently available uh, and marketed in, in internationally. Uh, the last investigational drug I want to talk about just because it's got uh, a novel mechanism is elibixabat. This is a locally acting ileal bile acid transporter uh, inhibitor, uh, so uh, inhibits resorption of bile acids in the uh, terminal ileum, functionally inducing a, a cholerate diarrhea. Um, it's approved in Japan. There's an IND active in the United States. Um, phase three trials have been conducted abroad uh, in functional constipation patients, and uh, the agent has demonstrated benefit over placebo, as you can see here. So with all these options uh, available and forthcoming, I think uh, an intuitive question to ask is how do you decide? One uh, practical consideration would be um, whatever you get approved, recognizing that newer drugs are often more expensive and uh, associated with higher hurdles to clear uh, for insurance uh, coverage. But I think probably the more clinically relevant question is, um, are there differences in efficacy? Head-to-head -head trials don't exist and likely won't exist to the extent that they would need to be very large and 
uh, uh, expensive to split these hairs. Um, so in lieu of that, network meta-analyses have been conducted um, to compare these studies and um, give them sort of an efficacy ranking. Um, so important to note here that none of these agents are superior to the other in a statistical sense, but in rank order, lenaclotide ranked first uh, based on abdominal pain and complete spontaneous bowel movements. Tenapinor uh, was second, uh, according to those metrics, but first in efficacy for bloating. And this is per uh, a study that was done in 2018 and updated earlier this year. I'm sorry, that's all for IBSC, I should say. Uh, in CIC, a similar analysis was done, and procalipride shook out as most effective. There is some heterogeneity among how these studies were conducted, but in the case of CIC, the um, bias is probably in favor of procalipride being the most potent here because many of those studies were performed later than the others and recruited for constipation that was refractory to other medications. So in just in the last few minutes, I'm gonna talk about dietary therapy. Increasingly, and I think excitingly, there's been um, uh, interest in the provider community to match a longstanding interest among patients for non-pharmacologic uh, options for the management of constipation. Um, and coinciding with, I think, a longstanding anecdotal sense that diet does mediate bowel function. So one of the um, food products that's been of interest lately is kiwi fruit. Over the past decade or two, there have been a number of small controlled trials uh, involving the ingestion of kiwi fruit flesh with or without the skin that consistently show laxative effects. Just by way of example, this is a study from 2010 that looked at IBSC patients who were randomized to kiwi fruit and placebo, and improvements were noted in defecation frequency, fecal volume, and colonic transit time. This more recent study that was published just last month in uh, neurogastroenterology and motility looked at 11 healthy adults uh, in a crossover fashion on and off kiwi fruit and showed uh, increase in stool frequency on kiwi fruit. Um, also after a jejunal gas infusion, interestingly, they found no change in intestinal gas tolerance as measured by rectal gas evacuation, abdominal per perception scores and abdominal distension um, on or off kiwi fruit. So um, it's a small study, but proof of concept for the idea that we, we might be able to start thinking beyond just simple recommendations of fiber supplementation, recognizing that the form of that fiber supplementation may matter, other components of a food product may matter, um, and the ratio between soluble and insoluble may dictate whether that fiber supplementation vehicle favors prokinesis as an effect versus promotes um, fermentation and gas trapping. Just by way of contrast, prunes, also a fibrous food, were shown in 2019 in this study to significantly improve stool weight and frequency in healthy adults, but in this case was associated with a significant increase in flatulence. So with these distinctions in mind, we can start asking questions about why these foods work, um, what components in these foods seem to be uh, dominant in their effects, and which option might be best. To that uh, end, um, this trial that closed in 2019 and was uh, performed at the University of Michigan uh, will be presented next month. And I find this paradigm really exciting to the extent that it's um, imposing a really robust research framework on interventions that historically haven't been deemed meritorious of that kind of rigorous attention. So hopefully this is a, a paradigm that we can continue to follow. So I'm going to summarize just by talking about future directions. Beyond the London classification, again, my hope would be that this can lead to consensus criteria for normal values in the future in terms of advanced pharmacotherapy. Something that we do often anecdotally is combine therapies for people who are refractory to individual uh, agents. To my knowledge, this hasn't been studied robustly in the literature, but that would be great to see as well. Um, and then are there other decision-making aids that could help us navigate uh, this landscape like cost-effectiveness analyses? Lastly, with regard to dietary therapy, you know, we've made some important first steps um, in studying these interventions. Next come more nuanced questions like what's the right amount of kiwi to eat? What's the right amount of prunes? And so um, hopefully this is all as exciting to you as it is to me. And then I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Herja, for that great talk. Uh, interesting. Uh, maybe we'll all be buying stock in Kiwi soon. So our, our concluding speaker is going to be Dr. Alessandra Geisher. Dr. Geisher is uh, joining us from Nationwide Children's Hospital 
and The Ohio State University, where she's the Director of Translational Care. She completed a fellowship in pediatric colorectal surgery and is also board certified in adult colorectal surgery. She has a unique practice that focuses on congenital colorectal disorders. Uh, Dr. Geisher. Thank you, appreciate that. I really uh, also appreciate having the um, combined two worlds of both the adult and pediatric world. And that is uh, truly where my heart lies. So I, I am happy to be among friends who care about both the adult and the pediatric patient bridging the gap. So thank you very much for having me. Today I'll be talking about when kids need surgery and transitioning to adulthood. We'll be talking about surgical options for constipation, as well as what is healthcare transition, background, data, and long-term considerations. We know that everyone poops, but everyone poops differently. And we also know that sometimes poo gets stuck, and that's where we come into play. When there's failure of medical management, that's typically when the pediatrician has identified continued constipation, there are persistent soiling and accidents and medication side effects. And that's usually when the pediatrician then refers to the gastroenterologist. The gastroenterologist then tries different st stimulant laxatives, newer drug classes that we've spoken of, as well as motility testing that um, my gastroenterology colleagues have mentioned with clonic manometry and anal rectal manometry. In anal rectal manometry, I'll just briefly say here that we really do use this to assess and measure pressure and sensation in the rectum, and it evaluates the function of the internal external sphincters. Internal anal sphincter achalasia can be identified with our anal rectal manometry, and that is the failure of the internal sphincter to relax in response to stool distending in the rectum, as well as we can use anal rectal manometry to identify pelvic floor dysinertia with proper pushing and relaxation, as we just have seen, as well as severe withholding behavior. The treatment categories for anal sphincter dysfunction for internal sphincter achalasia include Botox to the anal canal. And when we find that there's pelvic floor dysinertia, Patients undergo pelvic floor physiotherapy and biofeedback with great success, even in the pediatric population. With severe withholding behavioral disorders, we find that pelvic floor physiotherapy biofeedback can be used in addition to behavioral therapy as well. Enemas and flushes are not typically permanent, but can be beneficial. It's recommended to use these for six to 12 months minimum. And that's because usually what brings a functional constipation patient to needing rectal enemas or flushes is this dilated colon, this dilated rectum that we've seen. And so we want a period of time where, where these rectal enemas will help empty out the rectum and help decrease the dilation of this rectum before we stop using them. We find that oral regimens are often more successful after a period of rectal flushes. This is because, as I've mentioned, the improved colonic dilation and the improved sensation that the child has, that the child can experience being clean. Some children who don't tolerate rectal enemas may qualify for an antigrade option, and of course, this requires a surgical procedure. This is the Malone appendicostomy, and this is a continent option for enema administration. This is where we create a channel from bowel to skin using the appendix or bowel if the appendix has already been taken in previous procedures. We do this creating a fundoplication or a one-way valve so that the fluid goes into the body and doesn't exit the body. Administration is done through a channel versus rectally. And it's, a, as I mentioned, a one-way valve that prevents leaking and it can close on its own if not used over time. And as you can see, we can easily, usually hide it very well within the umbilicus. As you can see here, there's very minimal scarring and this patient, this child has a Malone um, in their umbilicus that's currently not catheterized. Other options for antigrade flushes include a sacostomy. We use the sacostomy sometimes when um, the patient's uh, bowel wall habitus is precluding them from using the appendix if the appendix is too short. Or additionally, if urology has other needs to use their appendix for um, urologic reconstruction, say in a metrophenoc procedure. 
or if the appendix has already been taken uh, by an appendectomy earlier in their lifespan. This is where we have a non-latex tube placed through the abdominal wall into the opening of the cecum. We can either place, as you see here, a Mickey or a Chate tube into the opening, and this requires this tube to be in the site at all times. Sometimes this is also more beneficial for patients with behavioral disorders who won't tolerate their umbilicus being catheterized. Whether these enemas and these flushes are retrograde or antegrade, the process takes about an hour. We recommend that it's done at the same time every day, and the ingredients or the regimen varies based on each child's needs. We do like having colonic manometry, so we do know the results of HAPCs, whether bisacodal or different uh, medications work better for that child. When there are failure of these uh, measures, then an ileostomy or colostomy can be evaluated and used. Usually a colostomy is preferred if there's pelvic outlet dysfunction that is not relieved by pelvic floor physical therapy and biofeedback. Um, however, an ileostomy may be necessary if there's diffuse colonic dysmotility. And these aren't necessarily permanent options, but they can be uh, temporary options. So switching gears a little bit to healthcare transition. Healthcare transition is the process of getting ready for healthcare as an adult. The goals are to improve the ability of youth and young adults to manage their own healthcare and to effectively use health services. And I think we all can admit that there is a lack of appropriate transition uh, in our pediatric to adult care. Since the 1900s, we know that pediatric surgeons have been operating on congenital and acquired anomalies. And in the United States, 14% of children are identified as having some health care need. More than one in five households has at least one child with some sort of special need. 90% of children with special needs are now reaching their 21st birthday now more than ever. Yet 45% of them lack access to a physician familiar with their condition. 30% of all young adults aged 18 to 24 years of age lack a payment source for their health care. These lapses in transitional care have increased costs and healthcare resource utilization that are associated with adverse outcomes. In 2002, a joint recommendation was made by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and American College of Physicians describing a framework for a smooth transition to adult healthcare for adults with special healthcare needs. And the goal of a planned healthcare transition is to maximize lifelong functioning and well being for all youth. Transitional care should be used as a purposeful planned process that addresses the medical, psychosocial, and educational vocational needs of adolescents and young adults with chronic, physical, and medical conditions as they move from child-centered to adult-oriented healthcare systems. Adoption of transitional programs and application of these principles have been limited, especially in pediatric surgery. We know that pediatric surgical subspecialties have developed and this results in significant improvement in the quality and general and specialty specific pediatric surgical care. However, pediatric and adult surgical services have become increasingly separated from each other. Surgeons working exclusively with adults are treating a growing number of patients with a history of major reconstructive surgeries during childhood. And this is without proper training and awareness of the medical issues that are particular to this group of adults. We know that an unsuccessful surgical transition results in physical and mental health implications for young adults, negative long-term outcomes, and suboptimal use of healthcare resources. In 2001, the AHA published a landmark article on how to transition the care of children with congenital heart disease into the adult healthcare system. The special focus was given to epidemiology, timing, method of transition, and quality of life and social dynamics. Anal rectal malformation in Hirschsprung patients are an especially vulnerable population. This is due to their ongoing surgical, physiologic, and psychosocial challenges. And there's no international consensus for long-term follow-up or transition of care into adulthood. And this also transitions um, into easily into our functional constipation patients as well. However, there's not a lot of data on functional constipation patients, but there is a little bit more on anal rectal malformation in Hirschsprung's patients. In this survey done in 2015, looking at the Pediatric Colorectal Club and a majority of European uh, responders, they found that 73% offered a multidisciplinary team routinely from birth. 89% acknowledged that teenagers developed significantly new, new problems requiring this multidisciplinary team in their teenage years, 
This includes fecal continence, psychosocial issues, and poor quality of life. However, 33% of surgeons discharged patients from their care before 10 years of age. When asked if they regularly employ multidisciplinary meetings with adult practitioners and transition coordinators, 82% said no. And asked if they have a defined pathway or protocol to transition patients, 72% said no. The barriers to transition of care include lack of structure in current transition program and parental reluctance to transition. But if there's no structure in place, can you blame the parents that they don't want to transition? When we looked at the American response to a similar perspective on transition, we found that pediatric surgeons, the majority of them are treating patients uh, greater than 25 years old in the diagnoses of Hirschsprung's disease and anorectal malformation. Chronic constipation and inflammatory bowel disease are a little bit lower on this list. The perceived barriers to transition of care in young adults was lack of qualified adult surgeons. And looking in a systematic review of anal rectal malformations, we find that there are very much long-term problems that include fecal incontinence, chronic constipation, erectile dysfunction, ejaculatory dysfunction, as well as urinary incontinence, letting us know once again that an multidisciplinary team is vital to these patients. When we look at the health-related quality of life for these patients, fecal continence and urinary continence significantly predict physical health-related quality of life. Their fecal continence and maladaptive coping strategies, which include denial, behavioral disengagement, substance abuse, and self-blame, significantly predict mental health-related quality of life. Interventions that are targeted at coping strategies for higher risk patients may improve these outcomes. There are also malignancy considerations to think of. Pull through anorectal malignancies are rare, but they are reported in at least 12 patients. Adenocarcinoma cases start as young as 21 years old with a mean of 43 years. And the theory is that the neoplasm originates from the remnants of the rectal mucosa outside of the neorectum. And this is seen in our anorectal malformation patients with the remnant of the original fistula or rectovaginal fistula remnants. Patients with ureterosigmoidostomy have 5% colorectal cancer risk, which is a 100-fold increase compared to the general population. The recommendation is for an annual flex sig starting at 10 years after surgery. Anorectal malformation screening should also undergo annual digital rectal exam with a possible annual flex sig starting at young adulthood. If a patient is symptomatic, however, the workup should include colonoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy, as well as retrograde and voiding sister urethrogram and urethroscopy to look at that root or the remnant of the original fistula. So what does the healthcare transition timeline look, look like? Well, we really want to start from the beginning, letting the family know and letting the patient know of what the policy is. So they set that expectation that one day they will transition to the adult care. At 14 years, you want to initiate healthcare transition planning. At 16, prepare the youth and the parents for adult model of care and discuss the transfer. You want to make sure that you have identified an adult provider to transition at around 18 to 22. After the transition is made with a, a full transfer package, you want to make sure that the transfer has appropriately occurred and get feedback from the adult provider. So again, the process starts at about 12 to 14 years. A general health knowledge tool is used to assess the patient's understanding of their health care. And we do this with an annual readiness to transition worksheet. It's completed by both the caregiver and the patient because you have to know when the caregiver is ready to release their, their child as well as when the patient is ready to be released. This helps us know when the patient can assume 100% medical responsibility. Again, you need to identify an adult provider and have a complete medical and surgical summary. And the transfer completion should be documented by the accepting adult provider. So the model that we use at Nationwide Children's in Ohio State is that the adolescent patient is seen at Nationwide Children's Hospital by the colorectal surgeon, and the next appointment after transition is at the adult hospital by the same colorectal surgeon, myself, who is both pediatric and adult colorectal surgery training. We also offer the same multidisciplinary care team that we do in the pediatric side on the adult side, with full support from our pediatric and adolescent gynecologist um, who also does adult obstetrics and gynecology, Dr. Jerry Hewitt, 
as well as our urologist who does myelomeningocele transitional care, who's our urology reconstruction specialist, Dr. Goderon. We also have a CATCH program, which is a comprehensive adolescent and adult transitional care home. This is a medical care and social support services for adolescents and young adults with chronic childhood conditions. This provides personalized multidisciplinary clinical services to bridge the transition from pediatric to adult, and this is in 17 years or older, and this is when the patient is followed by one or more specialists within the nationwide system. Here are some additional transitional resources. And this is just a, a short um, little patient summary to show you how important it is to have colorectal transitional care. This is a 35-year-old patient with a history of cloaca distal vaginal atresia, and I'll briefly just say she's had multiple impactions throughout childhood and adulthood. And this is the type of patient that you really don't want to show up in the emergency room at 2 a.m. trying to figure out what their past surgical history is based on the scars on their abdomen. As you can see here, she's had a very long surgical history. Oftentimes these patients don't know what their surgical history was, and this is a patient who really needs appropriate transition and not to be just lost to follow up, which unfortunately she was. She presented to the emergency room with abdominal pain and went to the OR for yet again another manual disimpaction. As you can see here, she's full of stool. Her contrast study shows a very dilated rectal sigmoid um, and a very um, concerning exam. She has decreased sacral ratio, which we expect to see in a cloaca patient. This is what the patient looks like after one week of peristene management, and you can see, although she still has the dilated area here, we've been able to get her clean on her x-ray and clean from soiling. Our future directions of our group include multidisciplinary, uh, multi-center studies to prospectively analyze long-term outcomes using standardized follow-up treatments, assessment, and transition of care strategies, long-term outcomes for epidemiologic data for functional urinary, fecal, and sexual outcomes, and long-term outcomes for fertility in males and females, including best mode of delivery for childbearing years and the impact of that on fecal incontinence. We're developing evidence-based management protocols in teenagers and young adults. This will enable us to better understand which subgroups are more at risk for long-term active problems and using this to develop a risk assessment for adolescents. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Dr. Geisha, for your talk. That was fantastic. We now have time to switch over to the Q&A section of our meeting. So we've had several questions submitted, and I'll start going through those. And if you have more, please please enter them into the Q&A tab below. So we'll start with a question for Dr. Garza. In children with refractory constipation, what do you think the value is of anal rectal manometry or defecography to screen for dysenergic stooling patterns? Is it as valuable as it is in adults, do you think? Well, it, it's, um, I, I think anorectal manometry, like, like I said, uh, anorectal defecation, this nerve defecation is way more common in pediatrics. Um, so we want to see in the valuable to me is make sure there's uh, the rare is there. Um, we do evaluate for dysenergia, um, although we can over screen for it. Uh, the younger the child, the more fearful he's going to be, the more likely he's just to, you know, you're laying on your left side, empty rectum, people cheering you. It's not the usual way they do. Um, and I think we find the, I find the sensation threshold a lot more important and telling than I do the, um, the dysnergia per se, because most of our patients are going to be that uh, dysnergic to begin with. But yeah, we do assess it. Um, Defecography is not very utilized in pediatrics. Um, lack of uh, uh, availability, um, radiation, and uh, most of the role in my understanding of defecography is when you've already have uh, non-conclusive anorectal manometry in adults, you want to look for rectocele, enterocele, uterocele, and those in pediatrics are not usually um, our concern. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Huja, this one's for you next. Um, what do you, could you comment on the use and your opinion of, of the use of long-term stimulant laxatives and colonic inertia or cathartic colon in, in adults? Yeah, it's a great question. I um, agree with the data that Dr. Garza presented that the, at least the more recent data has um, 
calls into question older data that suggests that uh, tolerance or acne could be induced by the long-term use of stimulants. Um, I still don't use it as a first line option, just given that sort of historical controversy because our tool set, again, as Dr. Garza said, is so big. Um, I usually start with osmotic laxatives uh, and then move on to advanced pharmacotherapy if needed. Um, but I think if patients come to me on uh, stimulant laxatives, I don't actively take them off of it. I think the other thing with stimulants that sometimes gives me pause is uh, that they can be associated with abdominal cramping. And, and um, in general, I have better luck with, with the advanced agents that I talked about. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Geisher, this is a question for you. Can you do Malone procedures in adults? And what are the issues with this procedure? And what about in small sized adults like those who might have cerebral palsy or cystic fibrosis? Absolutely, that is a great question. Um, I think the criteria for doing a Malone are similar as they are in pediatric and adult. Um, oftentimes, patients come to us, they've already had an appendectomy, um, but if they haven't had an appendectomy, the concern is the abdominal wall length. Um, sometimes adults have a thicker abdominal wall length uh, thickness than pediatric patients do, and so the appendix may not reach um, to the same distance that they might in, um, in pediatrics. I do prefer to do a wrap, the fund application for my Malones. I know, especially in the UK and some other centers here in the US, they'll do a Malone with just the appendix into the cecum with no wrap. I do find those patients leak far more and their quality of life is less. Um, they do complain um, if they don't have that wrap, but that does buy you a little bit more length on the appendix on patients who may have a thicker abdominal wall. Um, a neo-appendicostomy or making a tubularized segment of colon uh, based off a single vessel is less successful in adults because of, of the thicker abdominal wall. Um, and Interestingly enough, when we have patients who have Malone's and we introduce them to the peristine system, we actually find that they prefer the peristine system, especially in the adult population. In Europe, they use peristine far more than we do in the United States. And we actually have patients asking for their Malone to be taken down or reversed because they prefer the peristine. So oftentimes I will give that, the adult patient the option to try peristine first or um, versus doing the Malone, or stichostomy if their abdominal girth um, is prohibitive to a Malone appendicostomy. Great, thank you. Great answer. Uh, this is another question for Dr. Garza. Are centers doing the balloon expulsion test for children? Um, some centers are. Um, me personally, I, I don't perform it. Um, there's some uh, papers out there, very few, about pediatric uh, defecation and balloon expulsion tests. One compared anorectal manometry is about in 2013 and um, said that if you had a normal anorectal manometry, the patients had a normal balloon expulsion test. I think it depends on the age. The younger the patient is the hardest to do. And also, um, we don't have any data to say what's the right volume of uh, the balloon that would be beneficial based on the changes in age and size. So um, um, it, it is uh, complementary and some centers use it, but uh, at this point it's not widespread or um, there's no data that supports that it will change any outcome yet. Great, thanks. Dr. Ahuja, another question for you. How do you utilize colonic manometry testing in, in your adult practice or how is it used in the adult world? It is not, uh, at least in my practice. Um, I know of only a couple of centers that, that use it, and to my knowledge, they use it sparingly. Um, I think it would be helpful to characterize, um, to characterize uh, segmental colonic function um, in view of surgical planning, but um, all of the agents that I uh, recommended are not necessarily uh, attentive to the idea of um, colonic manometry results, nor are they uh, attentive to the very crude, uh, or relatively crude modality of colonic transit testing with something like SIDS markers. I mean, we, we do it, um, and I think it can be instructive, particularly for surgical planning or for um, 
increasing the threshold of suspicion for uh, an outlet disorder if they're all pulled in the recto sigmoid. Um, but even procalipride, which is ostensibly a, a prokinetic option, is, is a proof of chronic idiopathic constipation, which is a diagnostic that is agnostic to transit time. So uh, it's a very long-winded answer to say I, I don't use it. Okay, great. Thanks. And then we've got time for one last question for Dr. Geisher. You mentioned uh, you know, Botox can be used uh, for fecal, kids with fecal impaction. It's done by some and, and not others. When do you generally recommend using anal Botox? So typically we use that in patients with anal achalasia and that's usually seen on the anal rectum manometry. Um, and that, I think that's the, the largest benefit uh, patient population that we see outside of Hirschsprung's patients who postoperatively have a good pull through, have a uh, well ganglionated segment with non-hypertrophic nerves on their pull through, certainly that's a patient population that benefits most greatly from Botox. Um, in general, I think uh, patients with pelvic floor dysinertia don't benefit very much from Botox. Um, however, the anal achalasia patients as seen on the anal rectum manometry do have, I think, the most benefit to Botox. Great, perfect. Well, that's about all the time we have today. Thank everyone for participating for our, for our panel and for everyone that tuned in. Be sure to tune in next month on October 7th for a stimulating discussion on neuromodulation and stimulation. That's all we have for tonight. Thanks and bye.